dancing shoes on no matter what. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Jenny Russell. Welcome to Her Health and Happiness right here on UK Health Radio, your only real feel-good radio station. Now available on Alexa. Just say Alexa, play UK Health Radio. How are you doing? I hope, like me, you to remember that you are blessed and highly favoured, a magnet for miracles, the solution to someone's problem, and the answer to somebody's prayer. And today, I hope the interviews that I've done, interviews, plural, will be the answer to many people's prayers. So we have got a packed show. We've got Dr. Guy Meadows from Sleep School, and we're talking about the impact a lack of sleep has on productivity, health, and mood. From the 20th to the 26th of February, it is Cancer Prevention Action Week, and I spoke with the wonderful Dr. Helen Croker, Head of Research, and Matthew Lambert, both from World Cancer Research Research Fund, and we're talking about removing the processed meat from our sandwiches as we focus on the impact it has on bowel cancer. And then I spoke with Mark Kaiserly, Corporate Responsibility at the Post Office, and Leslie Francis, who's a postmaster. I called her a postmaster S. I do apologise, Leslie, but they called her a postmaster. And we're talking about lonely Britons. Now, before we go into those three things, I just want to make a comment about the recent strikes and what's been happening. And I want to say, before I start, that I understand, for me, I've said it so many times, the things that are most valuable are the things we tend to value the less. This is why this show is called Her Health and Happiness. I potentially, or particularly, focus on female intimate health and the whole person. Now, people say, oh, my health is priceless. But actually, when you tell them they have to pay for something, they start to say it's too expensive. The issue is, if we lose our health, we potentially lose our life. So what is more expensive than not being able to live? Especially if you haven't lived out your purpose and you have things to do. Now, with the nurses and the nurses strike and the ambulance strike, I understand that. I understand, I've always said, for me, we pay people that wear suits and ties way too much money to make lots more money and tend to keep it for themselves and not share it fairly. And those who we look to improve our life or save our life, we give them nothing. We came out and clapped for the nurses, but we won't give them a pay rise. I will say it over and over again. The government, the MPs, gave themselves an 11% pay rise on their 80 plus thousand salary, plus all their grants and things they get on the top. And then said, we won't take anything in the second year of lockdown, but told nurses and that we will clap for you, but we won't give you anything. When they were working ridiculous hours and putting themselves in the front line of this pandemic. But, but... As one nurse did say to me in North Middlesex Hospital, my mum was in hospital two weeks ago. If you do this job for the money, you are in the wrong profession. You have to do this job for love. And the reason why I'm making this completely, this comment is because North Middlesex Hospital in Edmonton is a teaching hospital. And all I want to say to the government, this is really a plea to the government. What are you teaching those nurses and doctors in North Middlesex Hospital? Because my mum's experience in the same ward, Emerald Ward, Emerald Ward, I'm calling you out. You have a complete lack and disregard for your patients in that ward. It's ridiculous. I had to call the ambulance for my mum two Saturdays ago, three Saturdays ago. And again, we were blue lighted to hospital. The lady put the catheter in in the ER. We're worried about her sodium levels. She's got dementia. She has out, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. She has diabetes. We're worried about that. The doctors come later on and tell me they're worried about the sodium levels and the lactate. I put two and two together and make four at being a nutritional lifestyle coach. I said, are you not worried about the fact that there's not much urine in the bag? But what had actually happened is if someone had moved the covers, would have realised the catheter was not fitted properly and mum was laying in her urine. Now we move her into the ward. 
They're taking pictures to make sure there's no sores because the sore they created last year and they saw it healed. But by the Monday, they suddenly realised the sore has opened up. Trying to say it came from home, but we had those pictures. Now, I have to give you the whole story. I'm really sorry. I hope this makes sense. But this is what happened. We, the carers came in. We were there all the time to look after mum because the carers came on two different days and had to change all the bed sheets. My mum's in a room furthest away from the nurse's station and she's one of the most vulnerable. But when she was sent home, she was sent home. The doctor came to speak to me. The metformin had been removed. So I looked up why metformin had been removed. And that had a, had, does play a role in the raised sodium and lactate production in my mum, which could would have a devastating impact on the kidneys, which was an issue. But when I asked the doctor that was left to, to discharge my mum on the Friday, he didn't even realise she took metformin. Does anybody read notes? That's what is really worrying. This happened last year. The doctor told me, a doctor told me, his exact words were, but I will not say the swear word, it has been a complete F up when it comes to your mum's care. That was his exact words. And I got the same thing. She came home with the catheter. It wasn't, I think, in moving, it didn't empty. A district nurse came and removed it. Another one put one in on Saturday. My mum ended up pulling it out herself, so I think she's damaged herself. But I went back to get the discharge form, which never mentioned the catheter, which never mentioned the saw, so it's not complete. They never had it ready when she was going, and that was my mistake, where they convinced me they would have it ready, and I could come and collect it. I said to the nurse, this could cause problems for my mum, and it could have cost her her life. Let me tell you the response. It could have cost her her life, yes, but you can complain if you want to. Yes, all in one. Tapawa, T-A-P-I-W-A, that was her name. Now, I know they're under stress. She said, and I recorded them secretly, it's so much more than what we can do. It's too much work for one person. So you say that you're going to send the information to the, di to the district nurse. But when I call the district nurse, they have got no information. I had to go back to the hospital on the Saturday, stand over the desk and wait for her to do it. I've done it, but I just haven't had the time to email it and post it. I'm too busy. So I said, OK, I'll just wait till you do it then. Because you've caused us a problem. Because you haven't completed what you need to do. The district nurses team don't know nothing about it. It's because my mum's under palliative care why they came out and showed compassion. I love that you do and you want to look after people. But you cannot tell patients, children, yeah, we could have killed your parent, but if you want to complain, you can do. I want to be on your side. I want to be on your side. I just understand that you're understaffed, you're overworked. So let us come in and let us be there and let us help you then. Rather than saying, get out, it's visiting time, it's over. Let us help you because there's no need for anyone to lose their parents under those circumstances when clearly you can be that flippant in your response. It doesn't help anybody and it doesn't help you because you don't know which parent you're talking to or which child you're talking to and what platform they sit on. That's all I have to say on the subject. Apart from that, at the beginning I said, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Mum is home. The sore is healed. She is hydrated till she can't be hydrated no more. She has good movement from her bladder and her bowel. Her eyes are alert. She's interacting with us again. She is back. Love, love conquers everything. Everything. Let's get into the show. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Today, I am blessed to be speaking with Mark Casley, Head of Corporate Responsibility at the Post Office, and Leslie Francis, Post Mistress, Post Master S, I'm going to say. And we're talking today about Lonely Britain. As one in two Brits admit to feeling lonely, 
in the last six months. So Mark and Leslie, welcome to Her Health and Happiness. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Jenny. Oh, it's my pleasure. Do you know, I think this is such a great topic because especially during lockdown, a lot of people were isolated and the loneliness figures must have gone through the roof. But <laughs> since we come out of lockdown, for a lot of people, those figures haven't really changed. Um, let me start with you first, Leslie. Have you found that? I, I think it's um, the numbers are still there. I just think the dynamics have changed slightly. Um, people mm. are still reluctant to, to, to come out, um, mix and or socialise. And then I think we've got a, um, a situation of isolation formed from the habits of staying in a lot before. Sorry, um, I mean, so for all my listeners listening, I'm right over Air Path in Birmingham, so I just missed that last bit. Could you just repeat that for me, please, Leslie? I'm so sorry. No, not at all. I think the, um, the numbers are still there. I just think the dynamics are slightly different. We've got a lot of elderly people and vulnerable people that were isolating before that are still reluctant to go out in, on, you know, into masses or large numbers or groups. Um, and then you've got the people that have become used to being isolated at home that are, are you know, maybe reluctant, reluctant to, to step out too. Yeah. And do you, feel, for me. do you feel, Leslie, that, that this is because, I mean, there was a lot of fear that were put in, was put into people, rightly or wrongly so, during the last two years. But that fear hasn't really gone away. We get we're getting all waves of things coming back, going away, coming back, going away. So then I think people are so worried about their own their own health and, and safety that they're trying to protect their physical health, but it's almost at the expense of their mental emotional health. That, does I that would, make sense? I would agree, yes. Yeah. And so Mark, what have you found? Because obviously there's a different perspective, I think, obviously female to male. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk through the survey that, that we've done um, in the last few weeks. We found that two thirds of people say loneliness is a bigger issue now than it was three years ago. And I don't think that is a coincidence that that is pre-pandemic. Uh, as, mm. as he said, a lot of people, you know, we changed our habits during the pandemic uh, and we got used to doing way more things online uh, and haven't fully come come back out of our shell from from those those habits of doing things at home. We were really surprised to find that, for example, the 18 to 24 age group was the most likely to find themselves feeling lonely. 70% oh, wow. of the people we asked in that age group said they had felt lonely in the last six months. That compares to just a third of people over 65. So it really does affect people right across the, the generations uh, and right across <laughs> the country as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like, like I said, for me, I've come, I've driven down to Birmingham from London this morning to do... I enrolled on a year ago but there are opportunities to do that course online because it's it's the last one especially I wanted to come down but it was very easy sometimes I'm looking after my mum who's not very well as well so I had to organize care for her so it can be very easy to well you know what I don't need to drive 100 miles to do this or 200 miles round trip because I can do it online but when you do it online there's so many things you miss church online there's so many bits that are missed and before you realize it you're pulling yourself away from so many circles and so many opportunities and then when you get further down the road you're trying to work out what's going on with you does that make sense absolutely yeah so what what are how can people it's it's really weird because how do we get people so I'm going to ask you first to answer Leslie and then you Mark how do we encourage people to come away from the screen and come back out in person and to and to literally to live because when you're behind the screen when you're locked away you're not really living does that make sense yeah absolutely I think that um for us we are um in a rural village so we there are only 700 people that live within our community um we are on a main road and we do service the local parishes um we are just a mile and a half from Andover so we get a broad mix of people that that do come in whether it's for two minutes or because they're passing or targeted you know drop off a letter or post a parcel or pay a bill um or just to to do a little bit of shopping um what we do and what we've always done is we're completely engaged in um friendly um um, open welcoming um we take every obstacle away that we can um, so we're open till seven in the evening um, in the week at six at the weekend and the post office is all available. Um, we have a social media um, that's just friendly and a bit of fun. 
um, and try and engage with those, you know, sort of people that, that that do follow us online. Put events on, say we've got something going on. Come on down and have a look. We've got new products. We support local producers. So if they're profiling um, a, a new product, um, we'll send a you know sort of an invite that way. Um, and then word of mouth within our community to just to have an open door. Really, that's the best that we can do here. That's fantastic. So you you an independent? Is this an independent? post yes. office because yeah. it's not what post office do in general is it no post office have their own um social media and, and, and other ways of approaching people which i'm sure mark will explain yes mark keen to hear sure so leslie does an incredible incredible job in her local community and i know that postmasters up and down the country do very very similar things uh, i've heard recently from postmasters who will anything from going and dropping off a cup of coffee and sitting with customers who used to come to the post office but might not be able to now they will go and, and have a chat with them at home there's all sorts of amazing things that go on uh, right across the country thanks to our postmasters taking initiative and doing what they know is right for their community there is no one size fits all there is nothing that we could put a stamp across the whole country it all depends on what's happening in that individual community and that's what our postmasters can do you asked about what reasons we can give people to go and, and have those interactions in their local community one of the the campaigns that we're running at the minute is with the trussell trust uh, we're encouraging people to no matter who they bank with uh, it could be one of the big high street banks building society we support so many different banks uh, customers come and withdraw cash at the post office as part of your daily or weekly errands when you're off to do your shopping every time a customer does that we are giving a penny to the Trussell Trust to help with the fantastic work that they do and we're hoping to raise over three hundred thousand pounds to support them uh, until the end of March fantastic fantastic so where can people go to get more information then so I'd always suggest people go online, postoffice.co.uk. You can find out about the wide range of things that we do, surprising things that you might not know you could do at a post office, pay a bill, do your banking, uh, as well as posting letters and parcels. But we know that a lot of people aren't online. Uh, so I would always encourage people as well to pop down to their local post office. Just get, find an excuse to go in, buy a chocolate bar, check your bank balance, pay a bill, whatever it is. <laughs> while you're there, have a conversation with the local postmaster and their team, see what they're up to and see what you can get involved in. Yeah, and this is why I think for me it's so important because the post office is a, is also a meeting place, and you know, as you said, Leslie, as well, especially for your you know your community and what you do there, yeah, it's a meeting place. So I think it's also another little call to the government to make sure these places stay open because they are important. And I think when we start to take those things away, you know, as you said, Leslie, you've got seven hundred people, so the post office is vital to that community. We start to lose those things. We start to lose another opportunity for people to be able to come together. So that's that's my push for you two. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's my pleasure. <laughs> Guys, have an absolutely fantastic afternoon. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I do apologise for the audio, my audio at, on that interview there because I was actually sitting in my car and soft tops don't actually have the best <laughs> acoustics, can I say, um, I was on a course in Birmingham. I'd actually lined that interview up and I didn't want to not do it. So I do hope that interview made sense. And it was interesting for me, really, because I don't think of the post office as being... Well, I think of the post office as being partly a community hub. But I suppose, especially when you're living in rural areas and in a smaller communities, it really is an essential part. But many post offices, many of those businesses are being taken away. So, you know, let's try and save the post office and use it for more than just, you know, posting letters. And even if we then go and if we withdraw money, if it's going to put it into things like the Trussell Trust and help with loneliness, you know, a penny's a penny, but it, it all adds up. So question I want to ask you today is how much sleep do you get? And are you a person that says, I only need three to four hours sleep, when really we should be having seven to eight? We're going to talk about Britain's lack of sleep and its impact on our productivity and relationships and mood. And I'm blessed to be speaking with Dr. Guy Meadows from Sleep School. Dr. Guy, welcome to Her Health and Happiness. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, yes, this this a survey done by Twinings is really, really quite interesting. And I find it amazing that people don't think 
they need sleep. And I don't realize the impact that sleep has happened on them. So just before I ask you a couple of questions, their poll found that 19% of people, and I have been guilty of this recently, I have to say, think about rewatching Criminal Minds, which is not good. Staying up too late watching TV or films. 17% are stressing over finances. 15% are worrying about work. And that's just a few of the stats they found that's preventing people from getting more rest. What have you found? Well, I, I think, you know, what, what the, the, the research highlights to us is that, you know, sadly, you know, almost half of the UK population are, are not getting enough sleep. You know, then mm. we're not getting that seven to eight hours of sleep. And, uh, and and I guess most worrying for me is that, you know, a quarter, so 25 percent are getting less you know, than than five hours a night. And and that's where we, we know it's going to have a sort of significant impact on their mental, emotional and physical sort of health and performance. So, you know, one, once again, it shows us that uh, that the UK population are striped. And if we could just get a little bit more sleep each night, then we'd, you know, we'd really be able to notice that in our morning refreshment levels, in our, you know, sort of our mental performance, how we, you know, our mood, um, but also mm. in you know, various elements of our, our health as well. So like I can say you sound really sprightly, like really <laughs> full of life. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I think you, you, know, you have that statement that people say, are you a morning person? Are you a night person? And, you know, we've got this cost of living crisis. I understand that. But, you know, the Bible says, right, why worry about tomorrow, what you should eat, what you should wear, what you should do. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. So we sit there worrying about things we can't control, worrying about things that are ahead of us. We don't live in the moment and our mood changes. That has an impact, obviously, on our relationships. But waking up and and starting the day at my sister, if I ring her, say, what are you calling me so early for? I'm like, because it's daytime. (laughs) <laughs> it's like you know that we take that that grogginess and that that sort of depressed mood we take it into our day don't we yeah and I think you've touched on a really good point which you know is is definitely worth recognizing that you know we do have we know that our genetics influences uh the timing of our sleep so we have morning people so who like to go to bed earlier and get up earlier we've got daytime people who you know sort of you know fit that typical you know we'll go to bed about between 10 and 11 get up between six and seven and then we have evening types who like to go to bed say past midnight for example and and sleep in till you know sort of eight and eight or nine um Mm. and and it is about we know that you know it's not just about getting the right amount of sleep or getting the right amount of sleep on a regular basis. And actually, this twining research showed that 36% of people, only 36% of people go to bed and get up at the same time each day. So, you know, three quarters of us are, are keeping very irregular sleep. But we, what we also know is that we want to be, if we can, sleeping at the time which is feels most natural to us. So for, you know, the early people, they go to bed early and get up early. For the later people, they go to bed later and get up later. And, and generally, then we will, we will feel better. We will have more energy. We'll have better mood, et cetera. So what about circadian rhythms? Because I know I, I do a lot of work with circadian rhythms. What about circadian health? Circadian health is everything. Um, you know, sort of our, our, for those who don't know, our internal body clock is 20,000 clock cells located sort of in, a, in an area of our brain called our suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it is responsible for keeping every biological process that we have on time. So our appetite hormones, you know, sort of our, our blood pressure, our heart rate, you know, and but also when we sleep and wake. And the interesting thing about uh, the body clock is it creates this 24 hour circadian rhythm. Um, but it itself is kept on time by our behaviours. And and I think that's what, you know, Twinings, you know, are trying to sort of help people understand is that, you know, simple things like keeping a regular sleep-wake cycle, having a regular wind-down routine, waking up at the same time, all of these things help to keep your body clock on time and therefore keep all of those biological processes on time. So everything works better. We're we're healthier, happier, more productive. Mm. And I think the thing that people don't realize, because I, I say to a lot of, of my clients and stuff, one of the fastest ways to get sick is to lack sleep. But also when you've got so many of these, um, everyone wants to be youthful all the time. Right. So I, I just turned 60 last last this, uh, November and I call it sassy, sexy, 60. But everybody wants to be youthful. They want to look young. But a lack of sleep is an it actually helps to accelerate aging, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it's. I mean, we, we know that, that sleep is the single most powerful health providing behavior there is. Um, mm. And, you know, I could rattle off, you know, everything. Hold on, stop does, one it, second. You have to say that statement again, because people <laughs> need to understand that statement clearly. <laughs> That it's sleep is the single most powerful health providing behavior. Um, <laughs> the one. It, it's, uh, it, so, you know, it, if if we look at, you know, we've obviously got that term beauty sleep. We know that sleep plays a really important role in the release of hormones such as growth hormone, uh, but also, you know, cellular repair. So, uh, you know, the nighttime is the time where your body is is repairing, is, is restoring, you know, all of the damage that we do during the day. And so mm. that's why we need to prioritise it. But it, it doesn't just stop there. You know, it, it helps us to manage our appetite hormones. So, you know, which, which is obviously good for helping us to keep a healthy weight. It helps to it even helps to wash our brain of toxins during the night. Yes. So it's it's absolutely wonderful stuff. Yeah, it's when we lay down memories, you know, and it's the memories that we lay down. So I always say to people, it's when you, the, the body has an opportunity to rebuild, refresh, restore. Yeah. And repair. And that that is done in rest. It's done in sleep. It's not it's not done when you're running around, jumping around and, and doing the things you're doing. So why is it, do you think that because I think actually, like I said, you know, being of an of an age as I am, we used to have you know three, I think it's two or three channels. And at 10, nine, 10 o'clock at night, you had the little girl in the square. <laughs> you ever see that picture, you know, the teddy bear. Yeah, that was yeah. it. TV's finished. Right. So, you know, you went to bed because there was nothing else to do. But now we've got 24 hour entertainment. And what I keep saying to my friends is, remember, you are watching people who have done the work, who are in bed sleeping. You are watching them when they've done their work. They've done the work. They're not doing it in real time. So they're in bed sleeping and you are staying up awake watching programs all the time. And this whole, you know, um, next episode thing, which is very dangerous. Because I, I remember when I got my TV, well, we changed the TV when it finally broke about four or five years ago. And I say to my friends before, I don't understand how anyone can sit there and just binge watch anything. That's got to be, I understand it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, it, we, you we have are... to make a conscious decision, don't you? You absolutely do. And and it is about bringing back a little bit of self-control, um, which is really challenging when, you know, you have such you know, sort of attractive digital technology. And I think this, this Twinings research really points that, you know, with, you know, you, you've already said that, you know, 20% of us are staying up late watching TV. But, you know, when it comes to waking up in the night, you know, 41% turn to our screens or 20% jump straight into emails. And and so we just have to be really careful with our our, our, our digital devices, not only because of the, the, the bright light which they emit, which tricks our brain into thinking it needs to be awake when it actually should be sleeping, thus, it, you know, by inhibiting uh, melatonin, the sleeping hormone and activating cortisol, the waking hormone, but also mm. the content, you know, the content of these digital devices is obviously, you know, it's pretty good. You know, it makes our brain, you know, it, 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 it we want to watch more. And, um, and we certainly know that, you know, we also just love to scroll. It activates um, reward hormones such as dopamine, which which kind of we, we get a little buzz from it. So it is quite addictive. So it is best to, you know, a, a key part, key message from Twinings is about having a regular routine in the evening. Um, you know, and, and that can be as simple as having a go to bed alarm just to say, OK, it's time to start you know, putting into practice my simple mm-hmm. wind down routine, having a herbal tea, drinking a, a you know, sort of a, reading a calming book, doing some gentle stretches, you know, some prayer, um, whether it be, you know, some gratitude practice, you know, sort of all of these things help to activate what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which it, it helps to elicit the, the the relaxation response, which is just nudging gently the, 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 your body and your brain towards sleep. Yeah, and I think people need to understand that because I mean, I'm I'm a person that does not believe in TVs in the bedroom. So mm. you know, from when I had my oldest son 29 years ago this year, there's no TVs in the bedroom, so I'm not dis- uh, disrupted by that. I don't, you know, I I keep my phone in my room, but only if I wake up in the night, just to maybe, and I don't always wake up in the night. But sometimes I may wake up to go to use the bathroom, but then I may just tap it just to see what the time is. That's about it. But apart from that, I couldn't think of anything worse than waking up in the middle of the night and then scrolling. But I think what we don't recognize and a lot of people don't recognize is that living on cortisol 
for so long is really detrimental to our health as well. That's one of the things that destroys us. And, you know, it is our wake up hormone and melatonin is the one that wants to be released to allow us to relax, to repair, to refresh, to rebuild and restore. And we're not recognizing that. So sometimes we're using products to anti-age, then we're using sleep against ourselves to age ourselves. We're trying to live a life that's more healthy, that we're living on cortisol and we're just overworking the adrenals. So we're, we're, we're trying to do something good in one hand, but just our actions and lack of sleep is destroying it in the other hand. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think you've put that really well. I, I think, and that, you know, what I really hope that comes from this twining sleep census research is that is if anything, people choose to prioritize sleep in their life a little bit more, just to mm. recognize that actually this is something that's completely free and it's the most powerful, you know, health providing behavior that I can do. So whether it is that you want to eat healthier, whether that's you want to be fitter or stronger, whether that's you want to have better mood or manage, you know, sort of perhaps mental health issues, you know, or or just, you know, sort of look a bit younger, have a few less wrinkles, you know, sleep can help. Yeah, definitely. And I always say, I said to my friends that, you know, really there are six, or I call it seven now, principles of total health. So you've got thoughts, breath, hydration, sleep. It's really that order. It's, It's thoughts first, breath second, then hydration and sleep. Then it's food and movement and social interaction, which really came in. I made became more apparent um, through lockdown. But most people, when they want to get healthy, they skip the first four. They don't even think their thoughts have anything to do with what's happening. They don't think about breath. They don't think about hydration. And they certainly don't, in this modern 24-hour living, think about sleep. And so we always just think, right, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to do more exercise. We just choose exercises that raise the cortisol levels even higher. We don't really know and understand the food and the food qualities. So that's that's quite a mindful in itself. But actually, if you don't really think about hydration and breath and sleep and thoughts, then you're never going to optimise your health anyway, are you? Exactly. I think one thing that is really important for people to gauge, because anyone who's listened to this might feel, you know, they might feel it's it's too overwhelming. What do I do? And the most important thing and the advice that we always give is that, you know, just do something small. You know, just mm. make one small change, whether it's you start darkening down, you know, whether you start having a routine, you know, evening routine, maybe you, you know, you you, you start staying in bed, um, you know, and resting rather than sort of, you know, checking your mail, etc. Just do one little thing and put that into place. And that can has begin if you repeat it, that can begin to have a big impact on your sleep. Uh, but if people want to find out more about the advice that, that we're recommending, they can just go to twinings.co.uk forward slash sleep census and they can find lots of helpful advice. But it sounds like you, you're you already giving your uh, uh, listeners lots of fantastic advice as well. No, I do. But I mean, you get that this, this interview has been really, really powerful. Thank you so much for it. I really enjoy it. And I mean, the thing is, I tell people like if someone goes to bed at one, I don't expect them tomorrow to go to bed at 10. It's not going to work. But I always say to them, you know, start by going to bed at quarter to one. Sorry, one second. Oh, no. So sorry, I can cut that piece out. Sorry. Um, okay. You can start by going to bed at quarter to one um, instead of going to bed at one. Do that for a couple of weeks and then go exactly. back by 15 minutes. And it, it, over time, that time will, they will get to where they need to be. Does that make sense? Right, As because it's not, not going to jump. Like you said, they can lay down earlier and rest. Or they can say to themselves, I'm going to lay down. So if they're laying down earlier and just resting, then if they're going to bed at one, they they may lay down from 20 to one and just rest for 20 minutes and then see how they get on. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. Guy, I run that time because I can see somebody telling me, shut up. And I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Guy, it's been a pleasure. Are you on, can people find you on on, on social media? Uh, Yes. Um, uh... (laughs) I was just a little bit confused there. But yeah, so um, just go to search Dr. Guy and you'll be able to find me. But also, you know, uh, check out the twinings.co.uk forward slash sleep census if people are looking for more information as well. Excellent. All right, Dr. Guy, have a blessed day. Thank you so much for your time. You too. Take care. Thank you. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Are you aware that it is Cancer Prevention Action Week this week, 20th to the 26th of February? 
And also, are you aware that almost six in 10 Brits are unaware that processed meat could increase their risk of bowel cancer? So today, I'm blessed to be speaking with Dr. Helen Croker, Head of Research Interpretation at World Cancer Research Fund, and Matthew Lambert, Health Information Promotion Manager, also from World Cancer Research Fund. And we are going to try and encourage Brits to swap out the bacon in their sarnie. So, Dr. Helen and Matthew, welcome to Her Health and Happiness. Hi. Good morning. Oh, it's a pleasure to have both of you. So let me start with you first. As a as a as a non pork eater, anyway, don't and, and I don't eat processed meats, so this is quite a good conversation for me. Um, Dr. Helen, what is it uh, your research has found then? So, as I say, you've mentioned that we're launching this um, great initiative today, World Cancer um, uh, Cancer Prevention Action Week, and. Uh, World Cancer Research Fund, we've been looking at the global research on the causes of all different types of cancer for over 20 years. But this cancer particularly focuses on bowel cancer. And the reason for this is that we know that over half of the cases of bowel cancer could be prevented. And we also know from our research and research of others that there's strong evidence of a link between processed meat and bowel cancer. So really, that's why we're asking people to engage with this campaign and to consider eating less processed meat and to take part in the campaign by swapping out the processed meat um, uh, from their sandwich fillings for healthier options. And if they go to our website, they can find lots of ideas on how to do this. So Cancer Prevention Action Week, if you search for that online. Fantastic. And so, Matthew, um, what what um, made you instigate the research in the first place? Well, I think over the last three decades, um, World Cancer Research Fund has very much led the led the way when it comes to the global evidence as it pertains to. Um, so, yes, um, at World Cancer Research Fund, we champion the latest global scientific evidence as it relates to diet and lifestyle and um, cancer prevention. One of the links of um, of our diet that links to cancer, specifically bowel cancer, is processed meat. And over the last three decades, it's been a very much consistent, strong finding. So whilst people may be aware of various like, mixed messages when it comes to diet and lifestyle and cancer, we champion the latest global evidence. So our, our blueprint for cancer prevention, our cancer prevention recommendations are the strongest scientific evidence um, that people can follow to help reduce risk of cancer and specifically bowel cancer and what we're doing as part of cancer prevention action week is highlighting the link between processed meat and bowel cancer and um, limiting or reducing how much processed meat you consume is one of our cancer prevention recommendations so when people see or follow our cancer prevention recommendations they can be sure that they are following the strongest scientific scientific evidence there is globally as it relates to diet and lifestyle and cancer prevention. Fantastic. I think, I mean, for a lot of people that, you know, especially if you, you're going into town and, you you know, if you're going to the supermarkets, if you're going to a lot of the sandwich stores, there's lots of sandwiches with bacon in them. So, so again, so Dr. Helen, how are you going to be able to, because you can get people to do that at home, it's easy to do. So how do we encourage the supermarkets? How do we encourage shops like Pret or other sandwich shops that are available? How do we encourage those shops that have these, you know, like this, the Jake uh, chicken BLT something or whatever it's called or whatever. Um, how do we encourage them to make a sandwich? I mean, I know some of them are making different sandwiches now, but how do we encourage them to take those out of there? Yeah, I mean, you're quite right. There's there's a lot of um, processed meat available to us. And of course, our food choices are heavily influenced by, you know, what's around us, what's easily accessible. However, I think now there has there's a lot more popularity of plant based foods. So it's actually quite easy to find options which do mm. not have meat or processed meat in them. And I think a lot of that is being led by consumer demand. So people want those foods. So therefore, the food retailers um, do provide them. However, there is also an argument, you know, for pressuring, um, you know, for policies that pre- put pressure on food 
um, providers to actually move more towards healthier options. But this particular campaign, we're focusing on trying to help people, support people by providing them information to empower them to make their own choices, whether that be in the house or out of the house. So mm. really, the, the ideas that we've gotten, the suggestions will help them to, to do that should they choose. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really important. I think I suppose the worry is, you know, if you're if you're a farmer, for instance, and, you know, you, you're pig farming and you, you sell a lot of processed meats, then the, the worry and the fear is what's it going to do to your pocket? But then we've got to be able to get to a point where we've got to balance out the health of the people and, and, and the finance of the individual or the company. Does that make sense? No, I mean, absolutely. There's a, there's always a, a very fine um, balance to be had. And I think with um, this particular campaign, what we're doing is encouraging people to specifically reduce the amount of processed meat they consume. We mm. do have a recommendation to have moderate portions of red meat. So we're not saying to cut out meat from the diet completely, because, of course, we know that there's many um you know really nutrients that you can Mm -hmm. get from meat so it's about moderate portions of red meat but actually limiting the processed meat specifically yeah because i just say i just see a lovely half leg of lamb yesterday (laughs) (laughs) that's definitely stayed in my diet (laughs) so matthew where can people go to get more information then yeah, so people, if they just search for Cancer Prevention Action Week, uh, and that will take you through to our website and it will come up with loads of different recipes, um, ways to, um, um, a tip to reduce the processed meat consumption. Uh, we've got a fact sheet that's all about processed meat, as I said, to give people tips on how to cut down, um, helping people to educate people about what processed meat is and how to know if a meat is actually processed. We got a fun little quiz that people can take part in to get an idea as to public awareness of processed meat. Uh, and we've got lots of great um, sandwich swaps I do ideas on there as well. And that's what we really want as part of um, Cancer Prevention Action Week is for people to take part in a great British Asani swap. And it's very much all about swapping out maybe one of their processed meat containing sandwiches for um, healthy alternative. And we've got less to say. We've got lots of um, we've got lots of ideas on our website. And so the website, if probably one more time. So people to, people to search online for Cancer Prevention Action Week, and that will take you through to our World Cancer Research Fund website, uh, and that's where people will be able to access all the information um, about Cancer Prevention Action Week, which is running uh, this whole week up until the 26th of February. Excellent. And just before you both go, so I'm going to ask you first, since I'm speaking to you first, Matthew, yeah. um, what is your favourite uh, Sani then? Well, I must admit, I am, like most of the nation, a big sandwich eater. Um, I think, on average, I think people eat about three sandwiches a week within the UK. And I think something like we eat about three billion sandwiches a year, which is amazing. So for me personally, um, I must admit, I do love fish. So things like uh, tin salmon, uh, tin tuna, are probably my my, my favourites. But yeah, I, I mm. eat sandwich most, most days. But yeah, I'd probably say tuna. Um, some black pepper, some um, seasoning, there's some lemon juice, some red pepper, uh, chopped tomato, um, just add a bit of extra flavour to it. That's, that's my, my favourite in the week. You better post that picture then. <laughs> so <I can> do <laughs> it looks like. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, and Dr Helen, what's your favourite sandwich? I really like eggs and a, a boiled egg just sliced up with a little bit of pepper. Perfect. That will do me. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I'm not a sandwich eater hardly at all, but if I'm going to have some kind of sandwich, it's going to be, um, last week there's a Jewish bagel, ni- ni- well, not ma- anywhere near me actually, but I go, I go across to East London to a Jewish bagels, you know, the unleavened bagels, and they made love heart shaped bagels for Valentine's and it looks so pretty. And I toast, I sliced it, I toasted it. And then for me, the only feeling has to be avocado which if it was a man, I'd marry it. How sad am I? <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with some salt, black pepper and cayenne pepper. And then I just sliced it and put it on the top, put the top top in on, and then just took pictures of it and sent it to all my friends. I was going to say, you've got, you got to do hashtag CPAW and uh, and, and uh, at us on over a social all right, media I'll channels do, I'll to, it. to, I'll to share that. <laughs> hashtag, say the hashtag again. Uh, hashtag uh, CPAW. Okay, excellent. I will do that, definitely. All right. Dr. Helen and Matthew, thank you so much. Thank Bye-bye. you. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Another show, another week complete. So I think you got a great plethora of information there. 
there are still many people out there who feel lonely, who don't know where to turn or feel fear. I just want to encourage you that there's nothing to fear, but everything to live for. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We were given, born with this immune system. We just need to understand the environments and the nutrition and lifestyle factors that play a part in strengthening our immune system. And just to know that fear and the anxiety it creates and the stress that it brings into the body can actually be a destroyer of the very system you need to protect you. So come out and live. Come out and live because life is for living. You're given one life, live it purposefully and live it to its max because that's what we're there for. Now, I am running my 60-day challenge. By the time I come on next week, the 60-day challenge is there. Check me out on Instagram at Pelvic Secrets. Twitter at Pelvic Secrets, although I'm very not very active on Twitter, but Instagram definitely. LinkedIn. If you're thinking about your posture and wanting to improve your posture, I am your girl. I'm all things posture because it is a position from where all movement begins and ends. So if you want to improve your flexibility, if you want to decrease the risk of pain, injury or discomfort, if you don't want to struggle with leaking bladders because that is my forte to stop you from leaking and you want to enjoy life really well, then come and join in. Be a part of the movement. Sassy, sexy, 60. Pelvic Secrets at iCloud.com or find me Jenny Russell on LinkedIn and on Facebook. I've got the power within the pelvis and pelvic floor secrets. It's just to say I was interviewed as well on Facebook. I'm going to share that interview as well on YouTube, my YouTube channel, Pelvic Floor Secrets, because if somebody gave you a million pounds tomorrow and said, build the most amazing, extravagant complex or house, whatever, the first thing you would do is to build the fashion, something you do not see. As I've always said, and it's in my spoken word, my pelvic floor, something you cannot see, may either reward or debilitate me. Or the other pelvic floor spoken word starts with, hidden from view, not a thought or regard, the pelvic floor, your internal bodyguard, put under pressure all day and all night to avoid, avoid even embarrassment. The sphincters must stay shut tight. No matter what we do, the foundation we build things on dictates whether or not the things we build will last and last well. So if you want more information, 0207 291 Find me on all the social media platforms. But until next week, in health and happiness, stay blessed, stay relevant, stay well. <laughs>